Allora, direi che possiamo uh, iniziare. Eh, mi dicono che per il momento sono collegati soltanto colleghi e colleghe eh, italiani. Eh, allora, allora, il primo uh, contributo arriva da uh, Antonio Ielo e Francesco Ricca. Ehm, un lavoro intitolato Answer Set Computation of Negative Two Literal Programs Based on Graph Neural Networks Preliminary Results. Chi presenta? Antonio. Ah, ok, puoi condividere? Uh, si vada? Sì, sì, sì. Ok. Eh, good afternoon, I'm Antonio Iello, a master's student at the University of Calabria, and I will present uh, uh, some preliminary results on the work as well as computation of negative to literal programs based on graph neural networks. Uh, this work can be framed uh, into the context of neural combinatorial optimization, uh, which is basically a field uh, at the intersection of uh, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, combinatorial optimization uh, that aims to apply deep learning techniques uh, to boost uh, and, and, and augment the performances of uh, combinatorial optimization solvers. Natural uh, examples uh, of uh, application in this field could be approximate end-to-end -end solvers, or for example, branching heuristics. Um, Recent uh, works in uh, this field, uh, developed in these years, were successfully applied to the fields, of, for example, of uh, graph coloring, satisfiability, and uh, uh, binary constraint satisfaction problems. And these are uh, only some examples of uh, architectures uh, uh, for their relative uh, applications. Uh, the aim of uh, this work was to apply some common patterns that emerged in uh, these works, to a small fragment of one set programming known as negative two literal programs. Uh, basically, what these architectures, uh, these arch architectures uh, share as a common feature is that they apply graph neural networks to perform uh, a node classification task on a graph representation of the input program. And uh, these uh, graph neural networks produce, as we will see later, Uh, some node embeddings that can be decoded to obtain a candidate solution for the original program. Um, so basically, in this uh, presentation, I, I will introduce uh, negative to literal programs just to recap some uh, relevant properties and uh, uh, a basic introduction to message passing graph neural networks. Uh, so, negative to literal programs are logic programs whose rules are of this form. So, uh, alpha if not beta, and only of this form. And uh, the, the reason we choose uh, this, this fragment of as we said programming uh, in order as a toy model for our experiment was that uh, negative to literal programs have a natural uh, correspondence with directed graphs, as we can see in this example. Basically, given a program, a ground negative, negative to literal program, we can produce a graph uh, whose vertices are the ground atoms of the program, and there exists an edge uh, between two nodes if there exists a rule where the source of the edge is the body uh, of, uh, of a rule, and uh, the target edge is the head of the very same rule. Uh, this class of program has some interesting properties. First of all, uh, computing hardware sets uh, for this class of program is uh, still an NP-complete problem. And uh, furthermore, hardware sets uh, of this class of programs has uh, a graph theoretical uh, characterization in terms of the graph we just defined before. In fact, the hardware sets of a negative to literal program on P is the complement of a kernel of uh, its graph representation. Uh, also, these uh, programs, um, also an arbitrary normal logic program can be rewritten into an equivalent negative to literal logic program under as well as semantic. And also they exhibit an interesting pattern as the density 
of uh, the number of rules uh, in the program increases, that uh, it has been described as easy or easy by some scholars. And I reported a plot uh, taken from uh, a paper about the topic. Uh, where we, what happens uh, is basically that uh, as the number of rules increases um, and the approach is four, this is the case for progress, programs over uh, 150 items, uh, the probability that a random logic programs admits an answer set decreases, uh, reaching uh, um, the lowest point that is about 0, 0, 0.06. And then it sharply starts to increase again and becomes uh, almost surely satisfiable. Um, mm, um, in some uh, other combinatorial optimization problems, such as SAT, uh, there are exp um, ex um, explicit uh, formulas that link, for example, the ratio between the number of atoms and number of clauses to the hardness of the problem. Uh, while this has not been observed in, uh, in, the, in these uh, negative two literal programs. And uh, that's why these cures are obtained empirically for fixed values of the number of atoms. Uh, that's it for negative two literal programs. Uh, now we pass to uh, basics about message passing graph neural networks. Uh, generally speaking, a graph neural network uh, is a function that maps a graph to uh, uh, that maps each node in a graph to a vectorial representation in RK, uh, where K is, um, is known as embedding dimension, and the image of each, of each node is known as uh, either hidden state or node embedding. Uh, basically, a graph neural network is composed uh, of uh, several sub uh, sub functions that collectively perform a computation that which you will refer to as message passing round. The, um, basically, this is a description of what uh, this consists in. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, nodes in a graph are able to ex exchange messages with each other. Uh, these messages are generated by a message, a message function, which uh, we refer to with M. And uh, basically, each not disabled to exchange messages with its neighbors in, a, in, in the common definition on directed graphs. Uh, after this ex, um, message ex, exchange phase, each node pull, uh, pulls, uh, aggregates the incoming messages by a, by a function C that maps a multiset of uh, uh, real valid vectors into a real valid vector. And finally, it updates its own embedding with another function u. Uh, here, the, the domain of u is basically uh, its own uh, embedding before the message passing round begins. And the other argument will be the aggregation of the incoming messages. There is also an extra function, which is, which is called the readout function, which basically maps the embedding of each node into another uh, final uh, vector vector value. Uh, and this is, uh, if we want, this is called the node equation, and it's basically the explicit uh, computation that uh, each message passing round performs. And the idea is that we can chain together multiple message passing round by using as a starting uh, node embedding, uh, the last uh, node embedding that has been uh, computed in the previous round. Uh, the starting node embedding, uh, that will be like HV0, uh, is either uh, some kind of node features that we associate uh, to each node in the graph, or can be randomly sampled from a known distribution. Uh, what is important is that if, if all the mm, the functions involved in the message passing round are differentiable, then the chaining of message passing round is differentiable and we can train uh, uh, this, uh, this architecture with the standard uh, deep learning optimization techniques. Uh, so uh, our work is based off uh, an architecture which is called RANCSP. That is a neural network architecture that times to solve, to approximately solves binary maximum constraint, constraint satisfaction problems by performing a node classification task. Uh, the, 
the general arch- the, the run CSP architecture is supposed to deal with arbitrary binary constraint satisfaction problems. So the architecture is a bit uh, more complex than what, that, than what I described previously. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it basically is uh, not a single message passing architecture, but uh, a set of uh, message passing neural networks that operate uh, on uh, with different edges, but on the same set of nodes. However, if uh, the instance uh, of uh, um, the, the constraint satisfaction problem instance at end is uh, um, uses a single constraint predicate, then uh, the whole architecture simplifies uh, to exactly what I've described before. And in particular, the message function is a simple linear function that maps uh, uh, vectors from uh, uh, are uh, 128 uh, real valid vectors to the same dimensions. R is a linear function from the same dimensions uh, augmented with a sigmoid nonlinearity. U is a recurrent neural network, uh, basically a long short term, term memory cell. And uh, the aggregation function is uh, a mean, so it's not a neural network. And the authors of RANCSP have uh, successfully applied their uh, architecture to various problems, such as, such as uh, um, uh, this is wrong, it was max to sat, uh, maximal independent set, tricolor ability, and this should not, not have been. Big. Okay, uh, so the, the main contribution of the paper was to extend the RANCSP architecture to deal with negative two literal programs. Uh, the main point of this uh, was basically to start off the original RANCSP experiment on maximal independent set and augment it to, uh, to attempt to find kernels of a graph rather than just a maximal independent set. Uh, in order to do so, uh, uh, okay, I think I skipped a slide, yeah, I skipped this slide. Uh, basically, the, the, how RANCSP works is that it starts from a graph encoding of some constraint satisfaction problem. And uh, typically, nodes are mapped to, uh, variables are mapped to nodes, and uh, constraints of the problem are mapped to edges in the graph. Then, the neural network is used to produce a soft assignment that maps nodes to basically the probability to uh, belong to a given class. And this soft assignment actually is the readout function of, uh, uh, in the general framework of the message passing neural networks is the readout functions. Uh, such a soft assignment is used to minimize a loss function that penalizes uh, basically soft assignment that produce uh, broken constraints. And then the soft assignment is decoded to obtain a candidate solution. Uh, as I was saying, uh, the, the main uh, result of the paper was to, paper was to extend uh, this RANCSP architecture to look for kernels of a, of a graph rather than maximum, maximal independent sets. And in order to do so, we refined the loss function in order to take into account uh, the probability of each atom to be supported by some other atom in the program. And all the other steps uh, are the same. The computation of the soft assignment is the same, and the decoding is similar, except for uh, the definition of the soft assignment itself. And in particular, uh, the idea was uh, to, um, was to uh, correct the soft assignment of RANCSP, which uh, is to be interpreted as the probability of an atom to belong to an a candidate answer set, uh, that would be alpha of V, uh, was to correct that value with a value S of V, which amounts to the likelihood of an atom to be supported by another atom in the program. And uh, this probab- conditional probability can be explicitly computed. However, uh, in practice, it was not effective because uh, it introduced a bias towards uh, uh, basically atoms that were 
supported by multiple rules. And it was not effective because in the definition of uh, um, supportedness, there is no mention of uh, um, how many rules support an atom. So in order to overcome this problem, rather than, than computing uh, uh, this exact probability conditioned on a soft assignment, uh, we compute uh, the maximum probability of an atom being, being supported by a single rule, which we denote by S of A. And uh, basically we update our soft assignment to be this alpha prime. Uh, this is the loss function uh, that we practically, practically we minimize. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the same as uh, the uh, loss function in the RAN-CSP maximal independent set experiment, minus an additive term that they used to, uh, to basically penalize candidate solution that included the fewer atoms, uh, fewer nodes in the solution. Uh, it, it was not necessary because we introduced this, uh, uh, let's uh, call it a regularization term uh, in the soft assignment itself. Uh, as far as training and evaluation go, uh, we train uh, the network on a random stream of Erdos Rainy graphs uh, composed of 20 to 50 nodes and uh, density ranging from 2 to 5. The density represents uh, the number, the ratio between the number of edges and number of nodes. Uh, the testing set instead is still a random stream of Erdos Rainy graphs, but uh, uh, with more nodes. We target that. Uh, 150, um, the, the class of graphs with 150 nodes because uh, uh, we know they exhibit, where they exhibit that easy RDC pattern. And there we compute some uh, classic uh, binary classifier accuracy metrics. And uh, then we provide some testing uh, from uh, a slightly different point of view about how such a system affects the choice distribution uh, for a solver. Uh, this is a table uh, that reports uh, the accuracy and F score of uh, our classifier. And uh, basically the idea is that uh, after our classifier produces a soft assignment, we want to compare it with uh, what a solver uh, will find. So what we do is to, um, each data point is uh, obtained by averaging the results uh, on 1,000 uh, 1, uh, uh, randomly generated programs. What we do is uh, for each uh, of these, uh, these programs to run our uh, network on it to obtain a candidate uh, assignment that get decoded into a candidate answer set. Then we compute uh, the, the, the answer set with uh, a solver and uh, uh, we, compare, we compute accuracy by measuring how many of the atoms that the classifier classified as to belong to the answer set actually happen to be in the answer set. We do this comparison with uh, the answer set that minimizes the cardinality of the symmetric difference between the candidate answer set and the actual answer set. Computing accuracy, we compute the F score. And uh, we can see that basically the, the proposed solution beats the naive uh, uh, benchmark of, uh, of our balanced random choices. Here, random uh, represents uh, um, basically a heuristic which chooses uh, uh, an atom to belong in the answer set with uh, zero 05 probability. And we see that uh, this architecture beats this naive benchmark uh, basically uh, for all densities, but uh, that uh, the, the performance is drastically uh, decreased uh, as the the average degree of uh, the underlying graphs uh, gets higher. Uh, however, this, this benchmark uh, is something useful uh, from the machine learning point of view because uh, it's the minimum uh, viable benchmark uh, a classifier has to beat. 
because this is basically flipping coins to decide what's in an answer set. Uh, however, we, we are more interested in how uh, the, this could affect a real solver. And uh, in order to do so, uh, was basically to, uh, to decrease the, the number of information that, uh, uh, that the architecture provides to a solver in order to see if uh, a bit of extra information obtained uh, via the neural network could help the solver improve their this class of programs. Um, in this graph, uh, we report uh, the distribution of the number of choices that uh, um, an SP solver perf performs uh, on uh, a sample of, of these programs. Here we are focusing uh, um, um, specifically on programs uh, with uh, 150 nodes and uh, 600 uh, rules that are the, the, is the peak of the, uh, of the hard phase. And basically, uh, we can see in the leftmost graph that on satisfiable uh, programs, the, the neural network, which is the orange distribution, produces uh, a shift in the number of uh, on the left on the number of choices, which basically means that uh, uh, by using the neural network, we are able to solve more programs uh, with less choices. Uh, in particular, uh, what we are using is not all the not the whole uh, soft assignment produced by the network, but the five percent most uh, let's call it most positive ints and the five percent less positive ints uh, for uh, for each run on each program. In the middle graph, we see the same kind of uh, uh, choice distribution, but for unsatisfiable programs. And here, instead, we, we see that there is a kind of long tail uh, behavior that is most likely a byproduct of uh, how the, the network is trained, because uh, it is trained to, to, to minimize, is trained to look to minimize the number of broken constraint. And while this uh, gives an edge to the solver, uh, while uh, working on satisfiable instances, uh, it, it basically makes it worse on unsatisfiable instances. The rightmost graph is just uh, all the data not partitioned into satisfiable and unsatisfiable instances, and basically we notice both the shift and the long tail uh, behavior. Uh, in order to see it better, we, instead of plotting the choices, we can plot uh, the difference in the number of choices in uh, the augmented version of the solver and the real, uh, the vanilla version of the solver, we obtain this, where we say clearly that uh, it has uh, a, a good uh, effect on programs that admit uh, an answer set, and uh, it makes worse the performance of the solver on programs that do not admit an answer set. Uh, if we basically aggregate the data, and ignore uh, the, the satisfiability of the program, we see that the net effect is basically null, uh, if not slightly worse for unsatisfiable instances. However, this is uh, actually uh, somewhat expected given how the network is trained. Uh, as a recap, what uh, we did attempt to do in this work was to apply um, a very common pattern in neural combinatorial optimization to a small fragment of Vaswell set programming. And we obtained uh, some basic uh, results uh, for, um, from a machine learning point of view, obtaining a classifier that performs uh, better than a naive uh, random benchmark. Some degree of generalization as uh, it has been trained unsupervisedly on uh, smaller graphs and uh, kind of generalizes well to bigger graphs, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a fact that uh, the, the accuracy decreases sharply as the programs get more dense. Uh, instead, from a solver perspective, we've seen that uh, uh, it actually affects uh, somewhat positively, uh, positively 
coherent programs uh, choice distribution, although it is uh, um, it has a negative effect on uh, an incoherent programs choice distribution, and uh, it does not improve in the general case. And that's all. Thank, thanks for your attention. Any question? From the online participants. In the meantime, I have uh, uh, one uh, one question, just a clarification. Uh, it, sure. it is not clear to me uh, the, your claim uh, about the degree of generalization. So, uh, what, what's the meaning of general, generalization oh, uh, okay. in your context? Because in the machine learning uh, field, uh, it has a specific uh, meaning. So can you? Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, it uh, what I meant is that uh, the network was trained on uh, on smaller, uh, basically on logic programs of 20 to 50 atoms, um, whose number of rules was between uh, 2.0 and 5.0 in terms of ratio with the number of atoms, while the the benchmark were computed over graphs. Uh, sampled out of the same distribution, but that were uh, uh, bigger. So in that sense, uh, we were um, the network generalizes in the sense that uh, uh, by training on smaller uh, programs, we were able to obtain uh, uh, relatively good results on bigger programs. OK, so any more? Uh... Questions? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Antonio. Thank you. Uh, so, second talk um, Matteo Cardellini, Paolo Denardi, Carmine Dodaro, Giuseppe Galatà, Anna Giardini, Marco Maratea e Ivan Porro. Autos. Autos. Um, the contribution is entitled a two-phase uh, answer set programming encoding for solving rehabilitation scheduling. Who is presenting your, your Matteo. name? Matteo, Matteo, the first author, please. The stage is yours. Uh, uh, yes. No, no, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, so hi everybody, my name is Matteo Cardellini and today I will present our paper, a two-phase SAP encoding for solving the rehabilitation scheduling. Uh, we are quite a lot because this is a joint product, uh, project with the uh, University of Calabria and the University of Genova, together with SurgiQ, which is, a no is an innovative startup which is implementing this encoding that I will present today in actual product that is used by uh, one of our, our customer that is uh, um, uh, Malgeri, which is one of the uh, largest rehabilitation hospital in, uh, in Italy. Um, so first of all, a little bit of context and motivation. So the rehabilitation scheduling process consists of planning patient physiotherapy session inside the rehabilitation institute. And the recent study found out that uh, uh, sooner or later, one third of the people in the world will need rehabilitation scheduling because the lifespan is increasing. And so it's becoming more and more important, especially now in this historic period. We have, with people affected by COVID 19, we have seen that there is a condition called long COVID that has consequences that need the rehabilitation session. And so the demand, the demand is increasing globally. So the RCP is subject to a lot of constraints, both legal, um, um, because, for example, you have um, operators that have working hours that needs to be respected, 
medical because uh, patients remove my okay because patients um, needs to perform a certain amount of uh, session inside uh, the uh, rehabilitation uh, hospital and ethical because you need to put the needs of the patients first right so this all these uh, constraints have to be taken in consideration in order to find available scheduling and until 2020 uh, Maugeri managed to do these things manually okay they had a big board with post-it with it moved around and of course you can see this is not quite scalable and can uh, not reproduce optimal solutions so in this presentation i will um, exhibit a solution for the sap based on assisted programming and this solution is currently in production in two hospitals in Maugeri in Genoa Nervi my hometown and in Castelfredo and the, the benchmark has been uh, performed on um, real instances of hospitals, but also we will see a synthetic instances uh, uh, which shows the scalabilities uh, of, uh, of the system. So the approach is divided in two phases. Uh, one is the, the called the board problem in which you have to assign a patient to every operator. And then an agenda problem in which uh, you have to find uh, a start and duration and location for every session uh, between patient and operator. This division into phases is very important because majority coordinators need to have uh, the possibility to move things around manually because, of course, you have to introduce an heuristic that is not uh, so a computer cannot uh, foresee every possible solutions and so. Uh, coordinators need to perform some change manually depending on the situation at them. This, um, this planning is done daily, okay, so you need to, uh, to take an account of that. So, first of all, for the first phase, you have the assignment of all patients to the available operators. This is quite an easier problem, and you need to respect the operator's working time, what we called before we called uh, legal constraints. You need to respect the uh, qualification of operators because inside Nigeria you can have um, neurological patients, you can have orthopedic or long COVID patients, so each operator can have some qualifications. And then you need also what we call ethical constraints. You need to respect the patient's preferred operators. So, so maybe there are some, uh, some preference that is based on history because the patient is always uh, performing the session with the same operator but also something uh, regarding also humanity so you need to maybe some operators is better suited for working with old people other with younger people and so you need to take an account of that instead for the agenda problem what you need to find is uh, you need to uh, assign uh, a location for every session and you also need to um, assign a starting time and uh, duration um, because you could also have a supervised session in which the um, operator is working with a patient uh, individually, one to one, and also having a look at another patient that is performing the uh, operation uh, separately, you can have also um, one to one and supervised session. So you need this, um, uh, the uh, atoms that you see here start and length uh, individuate uh, individual session while x start and x length individuate um, um, the um, general session which is both one to one and supervised okay and of course while the uh, sessions are in supervised you can have two patients at the same time so in this case we have operator 42 and in at one moment is doing patient three while also is having a look at patient three while also performing an operation on patient 12. And then, of course, you have all this can happen only if it's in gym one. Instead, when you change gym, uh, you have only one session. Uh, so in the second phase, you have a lot of constraints. So you have to do, you don't have to have overlaps between uh, two one on one session. You need to avoid having session. Uh, both sessions because patients can have um, uh, two, up two sessions per day, so you need uh, to avoid having both in the morning and both in the afternoon. You have to move them um, um, during the day, and then you also have to assign fairly supervised optional time. So you cannot give uh, the, the patient uh, a lot of optional time only one to one patient, but you have to distribute the time fairly between all the patients. And of course, what we uh, before call it medical uh, constraints, you have some minimum one-to-one -one length of the session that you need to respect. So the patient 
needs to do at least one hour a day of physiotherapy session. If it does more, that's uh, okay, but that's the minimum amount that it has to do. So the other one will be performed uh, in uh, um, supervised. And then, of course, the, this is important uh, in COVID period, you need to observe the maximum capacity of uh, gyms. So you cannot um, have a lot of people inside the same gym at the same time. And also, physiotherapy session is one aspect of rehabilitation. You can have also a uh, logopedist or psychiatrist or, or other, um, um, other sessions. And so you need to take account of uh, time slot in which the patient is not available. And then for going to the weak constraints, you see that the highest priority one is that you need to respect the, the ideal length of uh, the session. So you, the, um, the coordinator tells you that you need to perform, I, I don't know, one hour and a half, so you have to respect as much as possible. So the minimum one is one hour, and you need to respect as much as possible what the uh, coordinator says. And then what we call ethical uh, before constraint, you need to respect as much as possible the preferred time and period. So maybe some patient would like to perform the session in the morning or the afternoon at some uh, uh, time. And then also optional session, you should try to make uh, the session um, uh, so you take the largest amount of session possible because maybe the, the coordinator says uh, you need you have to do one session, of course, but if you do two is better. So there are some sessions that are optional, and if you include them in the um, in the solution, that would be an optimal one. So we, um, as we said before, we did an experiment analysis of uh, Mount Jerry Institute. These are the numbers. Uh, so the operators maximum are uh, 18, a range between 10 and 20 for Nervi and also Castelgofredo. What is really important here is the density, which is the number of operator per um, the number of patients per operator, and also one important thing is the number of floors and gyms that are available in the hospital. Because, uh, of course, the, being orthopedic patient and neurological patient, you cannot move around between, uh, using stairs, so you need to have location all in the same floor in which the uh, operator is um, sleeping in, in its room. Um, so this is the results for the majority institutes. We used uh, Klingo in order to uh, perform our experiment analysis with two different algorithms. One is the classical branch and bound approach uh, with the restart on model option enabled, and one is the unsatisfiable core. So two different approach, one top down and one bottom up, in which one for you try to find the solution and then you, in, um, you restrict the solution in order to find more and more optimal one. Inside the unsatisfiable core, you try to find the optimal solution with uh, uh, at first, and then when you don't find it, you individually something that is called an unsatisfiable core, and you try to um, um, weaken the problem until you find the solution. And as you can see, uh, in for the board um, uh, for the board problem, the uh, branch and bound algorithm is more efficient because you can find more optimal solution in less time. Instead, for the um, agenda problem, you, the unsatisfiable core, give you better result. Um, now, the major question is, how does the problem scale? We uh, looked up uh, Castel Goffredo and Nervi. This is a Cartesian plan in which you have on the y-axis the number of operators, in the x-axis the number of uh, patients. And this line represents point in which the, the density operator patient is uh, an integer number. This is the position of Castel Goffredo. How does the problem scale with when we move towards larger and larger hospital like Montescano and Pavia that actually Montescano just started right now? So we wanted to investigate that. And what we did was we created some synthetic instances which have feature as close as possible to the one of real hospital. So the percentage of individual and supervised session, the medium length of operator shift, something that we find out from real data, and also we interviewed coordinators in order to have uh, synthetic instances that is close as possible to real instances. And then what we did is that we um, created these instances and uh, um, trying to find the results based on the number of operators and the number of patients. 
So of course you can have four results, optimal, satisfiable, unknown, or unsatisfiable. And these are the results for the two algorithms, okay? So you have the same um, Cartesian plan as before, and we can see a color map that which color depends on the, um, um, on the result, okay? The, all the experiments were done with a cutoff for 30 seconds, and every pixel that you see in the image represents an encoding of that specific number of operations and patient actually is uh, five, uh, I think five uh, uh, instances run and then average in order to remove outliers. And as you can see here in the board uh, example, you have a high dependency of the density between operators and the patient, right? When the density reaches, I think 2.4, 2.5, this, you have a transition phase between uh, optimality and satisfiable for the um, branch and bound restant model uh, problem. Instead, the unsatisfiable core, uh, when you move to higher and higher density, the problem becomes a no. In the cutoff of 30 seconds, you cannot find uh, a solution. So that's also why uh, in the board instances, the branch and bound restant model worked better. For this reason, of course, another graph that we can see is how much it takes to find the, the optimal, the best solution. And for this case, um, we see uh, clever results for Nervi and uh, Castelgofredo, the same as for Montescano and, uh, and Pavia. For the agenda, exact, exact same thing. Of course, we have to follow the whole path and go through first phase and second phase. And what we can see instead is a very uh, difficult, uh, different scenarios between the, the branch and bound and satisfiable code. You can see that the green uh, transition phase between green and uh, blue, so optimal, optimal final and satisfiable, moves toward the right with the unsatisfiable core. So we can find more optimal solution with the unsatisfiable core, but instead the, the transition phase between satisfiable and unknown uh, moves toward the left. So we have two different approaches. That, of course, is based on how the algorithm is performed. But the nice thing is that we can also uh, have some parallelism and use different threads in order to do both at the same time and find the solution quicker without regarding of the dimensionality of, uh, of the problem. So one other thing that we wanted to investigate is which feature contributed more to the final results. So we took all these um, results that were produced by synthetic uh, data and we um, um, trained a decision tree and that allows to predict um, the result of Klingo based on the feature of an instance. And oh, this is the board problem. As you can see, the density changes uh, a lot the, the, the solution. But another thing that we didn't foresee is that also the average qualification of operators it gives uh, a lot of uh, difference, okay? Because of course, if uh, uh, operators are more uh, are less qualified, so it, it means that they can only do orthopedic patients or neurological patients or COVID patients, of course, the problem can be subdivided into smaller sub problems and you have a, a difference between optimal fun and satisfiable. With this decision tree that we, um, we trained, we are also able to understand if the, our synthetic instances actually um, performs well and actually capture all the nuances of real instances. So we took the classification decision tree and using real data coming from real hospitals, we looked if our decision tree and the instances that, that the result that we found on real data actually coincides. And we found that for board instances, we have 100% accuracy. So the um, instances that we create uh, for board is actually uh, capturing all the nuances of real data. When instead for agenda, uh, we, uh, we have uh, an accuracy of only 80%. So conclusion of future work, we have presented these two phase SAP encoding for solving the rehabilitation scheduling. and. Results are positive for the institutes employed until now, but we can do better for um, a larger hospitals. So we want to improve the current encoding and, as we said before, combine the strats of both algorithms in order to perform better in every scenario. And another interesting direction, of course, is a rescheduling solution, because, of course, this is an NP, uh, it's a very difficult problem. So instead of uh, planning again when something small changing, we can reschedule. And 
maybe use previous solution in order to be faster in, uh, in finding the next one. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions. I have a question first, and uh, then um, can, can you provide a, a, an explanation for uh, the lower uh, accuracy on uh, the agenda problem? Uh, have you figured out uh, what's the problem there, why, yes. and uh, so on? Yes. You can use them. Um, one thing is that uh, when we looked uh, real data, um, we have Nervi that is up uh, uh, since 2020, and we have Castelgofredo that is up until uh, 2021. And as you can see in the real data, uh, Castelgofredo is the one with uh, uh, the number of flaws, which is higher. So uh, what we uh, understand is that um, when we modeled uh, synthetic data, we mainly looked at Genova Nervi, which are number of flaws and number of genes. While well, instead, Castelgofredo having more flaws and we have less data about it, we probably modeled the synthetic instances um, better on Genoma Nervi than Castelgofredo. In fact, that 80% comes from an average between Nervi and Castelgofredo, and Castelgofredo performs actually quite um, um, uh, worse in respect of Genoma Nervi. So, what we need to do is that to inspect the, and maybe change the encoding a little bit in order to find better solution for a hospital which have a higher number of flaws, which of course restrict or, the problem. Or at least some comparable, uh, uh, I mean, uh, location of, uh, because uh, you have less data, but uh, more structure in the, in the, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. More uh, floors and more genes, so more constraints mm -hmm. in a sense. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. This is an important uh, aspect to take care of in uh, future uh, uh, experiments. Uh, uh, okay. Any any other question from the audience? Uh, uh, please, you you need to come here because otherwise uh, they won't. Uh, <laughs> from. Uh, okay. So my question is uh, a curiosity. Um, what, uh, what are the advantages of using this uh, SP, uh, an SP solver for this problem instead of using a solver based on other technologies like the classical operating search uh, algorithm or something similar? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, one, one important thing that we have to consider when doing this experiment is that also we are working uh, with uh, with doctors and with people that is not uh, well um, able to understand artificial intelligence languages and how they are performed. And ICP actually give us the possibility to, to actually show the encoding in a sort of natural language uh, way that also uh, doctors can understand and uh, have them to validate what have you done. Instead, with mixed interlinear programming, for example, you have equations, and it's quite difficult to have them digest that kind of stuff. So, since this is a product that is going uh, real and it's working now nowadays, uh, we wanted to have something that is more understandable also by the client side. More questions? No more? Okay, we can uh, thank uh, Matteo yes, once again. Let's go uh, to the next talk uh, by Alessandro Burigana, eh, Francesco Fabiano, Agostino Doviera and Enrico Pontelli. Modeling multi agent uh, epistemic planning in uh, uh, ASP and a Bridget report. Uh, who is presenting? Alessandro. Alessandro. Okay, please. 
Sono, ma tu, voi metteremo a disposizione le registrazioni o no? Non ho capito. Come stiamo registrando? Sì. Lo metteremo a disposizione? Sì. E forse è meglio in inglese allora. Eh. Eh. Ok, so, um, I'm Alessandro Burigana and today I'll, I'll talk about uh, our ASP encoding of multi-agent epistemic planning. So, for those of you who followed the my talk of yesterday, you already know what multi-agent epistemic planning is, but a quick recap. Uh, we have a, an extension of PDDL planning where we have multiple agents and we want them to reason about the perception of the world and their, their perception of other agents, knowledge and or beliefs. So the plan will refer to, uh, the goal of the plan will refer to these two kinds of information. And um, here we have a similar example uh, like, uh, like yesterday, so we had three agents this time. Uh, we have a closed box and a coin within this box. So today, no one knows the coin position. So uh, we have these three agents and nobody knows the coin position. And we have another element here. We have them, somebody is looking and somebody is not. So when somebody is looking, we're assuming that they are aware of what's going on. And for example, Lucy is distracted. So when an action is performed, she will not know about it. A, an example of a goal state might be the following, in which Charlie knows the coin position, Lucy knows that Charlie knows without knowing herself. So we have this sort of intermediate knowledge. And Snoopy is not aware of anything which is, that's going on. And this is going to be explained a little bit better afterwards. So these three kinds of uh, uncertainty and knowledge. Okay, so uh, we're going to use the following uh, operators to describe the beliefs of agents. We have the model operator B, which uh, states the beliefs of, of agent AG. So a formula of the, of the type BAG phi means that agent AG believes that phi is true. And similarly, we have the common belief operator, where alpha is a non-empty set of agents, which uh, represents the common belief of the agent group alpha, which intuitively means that every agent in alpha believes that a formula is true, every agent in alpha believes that every agent in alpha believes that phi is true, and so on at infinitum. And uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, action systems in model logic, uh, the properties of the accessibility relations in epistemic states or model states that we want to impose are the KD45N actions, where N means that we have multiple agents. And uh, this is a very famous axiom axiomatic system which captures the meaning of the notion of belief. And similarly, S5 is a logic that captures the concept of knowledge. So again, here we use possibilities as an underlying formalism. Uh, and we'll do a, a quick recap. So these are objects used to model multi-agent information change and are based on no well founded sets. And this is the definition, the formal definition. So given a set of agents, which we call AG, and a set of fluents, a set of propositional literals, F, a possibility U is a function that assigns to each fluent a truth value. So this is the first component and uh, to each agent assigns an information state, which is the set of possibilities that the particular agent will believe to be true in U. So again, a possibility U represents a possible configuration of the world where both the fluent, uh, the interpretation of the world is defined and the beliefs of the agents are defined. And since possibilities are representable with graphs, so with uh, Kripke models, 
we will actually use graph terminology such as labeled edges and nodes to, to talk about possibilities, the, the structure of, the, of, an, of a state. Now we'll talk about this language. This is language MRO, which is a, um, an action description language for, uh, multi, for uh, epistemic planning domains. It is based on possibilities, so it uses them as a, an underlying formalism to describe epistemic states. And uh, it allows for three kinds of actions. First of all, we have ontic actions. Ontic actions are uh, used to modify some physical properties of the world, so the values of fluents. So for example, if we let Charlie open the box, we will put the fluent uh, opened to true uh, to encode the fact that Charlie actually opened the box. So the world now, the physical world is different from before. Then we have two kinds of epistemic actions, which are used to modify the beliefs of agents. In particular, sensing actions are used to modify some uh, belief uh, of the agent that actually does the action. So if Charlie picks into the box, he is modifying his own belief by uh, learning something new, by learning the coin position. Then we have the announcement uh, kind of actions, where agents can uh, modify others' beliefs by uh, saying something they know. So, for example, if Charlie learns the coin position, he might announce it to, uh, to somebody else to affect their knowledge or their beliefs. As I anticipated before, we have three uh, types of observability relations. So, depending on the attentiveness of agents, we might have three uh, different types of um, ways an agent might update her or his beliefs. So, for example, uh, if we let Charlie uh, look inside the box while Lucy is, is looking and Snoopy is not attentive, we have that Charlie is fully observant. That means that he is aware that the action is taking place, first of all, and also he is aware of the effects of the actions. In this scenario, then, Lucy is a partially observant agent since she's uh, witnessing Charlie uh, looking inside the box, but she's not aware of what's actually inside the box, if it's hair, heads or tails. So she's partially aware, meaning that she is not aware of the effects of the outcomes of the action. And since Snoopy now is not attentive, he is an oblivious agent, so he is not aware of the action actually taking place. So we have three degrees of observability. And now we present Plato, which is the ASP encoding of epistemic planning, which is based on the language MRO, which we just uh, briefly described. And uh, it, is com it has three main components. First of all, an initial state is generated, given a set of, uh, of formulas, uh, which describes the conditions under which the initial state, uh, the initial state of the world is. Then we have the entailment component, so we, we want to know which formulas are true in a given state. This is useful when we have to apply an action to check if the preconditions are true and so on. And then we have the transition function, so how the three kinds of actions we just talked about affect the state. We implemented uh, Plato with ASP and exploited the Klingo's multi-shot capabilities, so we actually had this incremental approach where we find we look for a plan uh, of increasing length. So we're able to give a solution which is minimal with respect to the length of the plan. And then given the declarative uh, nature of ASP, we were able to give a formal proof of correctness of Plato with respect to the semantics of MRO, so the transition function of MRO. So first of all, let's see how possibilities are encoded. We used uh, the atoms possible world, and we have three parameters, the time, the repetition, and the possibility index, the numerical index. So possibility U is given as a triple. So P is the uh, identifier of U. T tells us when U was created, so which step of the plan U was created. And then to disambiguate between cases in which T and P are shared between multiple possibilities, we introduce this uh, repetition R. 
in our framework also we assume that we know the real configuration of the of the world the state of affairs that uh, that we are in so we have this atom pointed which means that uh the possibility u is the real world what's actually going on from now on also we'll only use the the uh, parameter p to describe a possibility when this will cause no ambiguities so now we have other two components we have the information states to encode and we use the atoms beliefs so beliefs pu pv ag means that in the information state of agent ag in the possibility u uh, v is considered to be possible so v is in this set and now we have interpretations so the final step where we encode the fact that a fluent F is true in a possibility uh, with this atom, holds P, U, F. So let's talk about the entailment. Now, given a possibility P and a belief formula, we have different cases. The base case is when F is a fluent, so we just check that the atom holds P, F is true. Then we have the propositional operators, which I'll dealt with in the standard way. So for example, the negation of a formula is true in P. If it's not true that this possibility P entails F and so on for the conjunction and disjunction. Then we go to the belief formula. So a formula B A G F, so agent G believes that F is true, is holds in the possibility P if in all the successors of this possibility, the formula F is true. So we check, check it in this way with a not entailed uh, atom as a helper. And similarly, we check for common belief. So given a set of agents, AGS, uh, we want to check that every possibility P1, or rather P2, that is reached from P1 by following these edges uh, labeled with, with agents in AGS. So all of these possibilities must entail f in order for the formula cags f to be true so it's a similar condition to the belief only we we look for uh, uh reachability instead of direct successors so now let's talk about the transition function let's see the example where uh charlie opens the box so first of all as i mentioned before we set the fluent open to true and then uh, we talk about the observability relations. So we have Charlie and Lucy that are attentive. So this means that they are both fully observant. Since this is an antic actions, uh, we assume that everybody knows the, everybody which is attentive knows the, the other. So this is the initial state. We have two possibilities, heads or tails. We assume that heads is the case, so we represent it with this bold circle. And this represents the uncertainty of Charlie, Lewis, and Snoopy of these two possible worlds. So none of, of them knows actually uh, which is the case. But they all, everybody knows who is attentive and who is not. So now let's see what happens when uh, Charlie opens the box. First of all, we have to create the uh, updated versions of these two worlds. So U1 prime is the new version of U1, and similarly U2 prime. This is the new pointed world. And as you can see in the uh, fluent sets, open now is set to true. Now, since both Charlie and Lucy are attentive, we have that they now will believe these two uh, new versions of the world, while since Snoopy is oblivious, he's going to believe the old version of the world. So notice also that we are able to reuse old information we do not have to create new possibilities or new atoms. Uh, so we were able to cut uh, some creation of new redundant information. So this is the state that we obtain. And then let's go on and see uh, a sensing action. And also since sensing an announcement actions are pretty similar in the semantics of the language, we're just going to see uh, an example of a sensing action and then announcement are dealt with in a similar way. So now Charlie senses, so he picks inside the box and he uh, discovers the truth value of this fluent heads. 
while uh, Charlie and Lucy are attending. So now Charlie is fully observant because he is actually doing the, uh, this action by himself. Lucy is just witnessing, so she is uh, partially observant. And Snoopy, again, is oblivious. Now, this is the state we left before, just a second ago. And this is how it, what, happen, what happens when Charlie looks inside the box. So first of all, we have, this, uh, we have to update U1 Prime. And this is the new pointed world. Okay, this is going to be the perspective of Charlie. This instead is the perspective of Lucy. And uh, now we have to look to, uh, at the beliefs. So first of all, it's easy to imagine why we have this self loop here with Charlie. So Charlie basically knows that the, the coin lies heads up. But why do we need also this, this one? And the idea is simple. Since Lucy is partially partial observant, she does not know, so we can see that she is not aware of which one of these two worlds is true, but she knows that Charlie knows. So we have to uh, keep in mind, keep this uh, self loop here in U2 second to maintain the perspective of Lucy, of Charlie, with respect to the perspective of Lucy. Okay, this is an important step. And similarly to before, now we have the beliefs of Snoopy updated as, uh, as follows. So to clean up, this is the new state. So we see that uh, we do, did not change any of the fluence here, since this is an epistemic action, so just uh, Charlie learns something new. OK, and this is how transition, the transition function is, uh, is implemented. Then, as I mentioned before, we also had these three result, results where we proved the correctness of the entailment, the initial state generation, and the transition function of Plato with respect to the entailment described in the MI raw uh, formalism. Now we'll look at the experimental evaluations. So, first of all, in this top left corner, uh, we used some. Um, uh, benchmarks found in the literature, some standard benchmarks. Here we have a comparison between uh, different configurations. So these two, many and Frumpy, are just some presets of Klingo, and these other two are from an, another planner, uh, the planner EFP, which also I mentioned yesterday. And this is an, an imperative, a C++ uh, planner, uh, which is based on the same semantics. So we can see that uh, this approach is actually faster than um, Plato. And, um, uh, but nonetheless, the set of instances that we were able to solve with the two planners, Plato on one side and EFP on the, on the other, are pretty similar. Then we focused on the, on, the, on the times divided into the grounding phase and solving phase. And we see that the grounding phase is the, the occupies the smaller portion of the overall time. So the run is pretty efficient. And this is the number of atoms that we also measure uh, given the uh, in the various instances as of growing length. Then we also compare uh, how the multi-shot encoding affects the experimental evaluation. And we can see that in the Totality of the cases, the multi-shot encoding is way better than respect, with respect to the single-shot encoding. And in this other uh, benchmark, we can see uh, slightly better performances with respect to the EFP planner. So again, we have some uh, comparable results with the imperative approach. So to conclude, we have looked at a declarative encoding of multi-agent epistemic planning based on ESP. Uh, why this is also important because ASB helps us give a smaller and more readable program. So, if somebody is new to epistemic planning, they might learn it a little bit better with this uh, uh, with this tool, and also it helps with code maintenance. Then, the as we saw, the results are actually comparable to the imperative uh, approach to the EFP planner. And also, we were able to, to give this proof correctness. So we have a solid planner, uh, which we can use to give a, an experimental, empirical uh, correctness to other planners, which share the same semantics.
So we were able to, to find that each uh, plan that EFP found is actually, uh, to the best of our best knowledge, of our knowledge. Oops. Uh, correct. And then let's see at the future works. So uh, this is a, um, a work that was published uh, last year. So some of these things are actually already done. So we were able to announce the announce the entailment rules uh, by a lot. And we also gave a formal proof of correctness between these two languages. So in the full paper, we also mentioned this language, which is MI star, which has the same syntax of MI raw, but MI star is uh, based on grid key models and update models, whereas this one is based on possibilities. So we actually were able to prove this equivalence. And then we want to bring Delphic inside Plato, so the uh, possibility-based formalism, uh, which is going to be, um, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to overcome some difficulties uh, of the Plato encoding. And then we're going, we want to use, this is still a future work, uh, uh, we're going to do this one uh, maybe in the following months. We want to use Plato to implement novel concepts and more case in epistemic planning, such as trust, lies, and misconceptions, which will uh, able, enable us to uh, encode a much more broad in, uh, variety of, uh, of uh, real world scenarios. So that's it for the presentation, and thank you for the attention. So, um, do you have uh, any uh, application in mind, or do you, do you have an idea of uh, some uh, context where uh, uh, your declarative approach could be of greater benefit? Okay, so yeah. So the question is, uh, if there are some instances or real scenarios where uh, plate is better than, than other approaches. Uh, the answer is still no, because we have much faster approaches like EFP. So it will be it makes more sense to use them. And but rather, nonetheless, uh, Plato is still a very uh, young project. So we hope to actually uh, better it, and maybe uh, someday it will be it will uh, be most beneficial in some in some regards. Uh, but until now, uh, it's better to use uh, other approaches such as EFP. Uh, although it has to be said that uh, with uh, Plato, we are able to have this solid proof that whichever result we found, this is actually the correct plan. And also with the, with uh, ASP, we can find all the plans. So given a, a possible uh, problem, we might have different plans. So. Uh, of the same length, and this actually gives us all the, the possible solutions. We just have to uh, run the, the command, uh, the Klingo line command. And this might be useful in some, in some practical uh, applications as well. So I hope this answers the question. Thanks. Um, any questions from the audience? I have a question. Uh, Laura, sorry, uh, I need I, to I need to iconize first, and then I will discover. <laughs> okay, Laura, please. Uh, I have a small question. Um, I would like to ask you. You have mentioned that uh, Plato is uh, the correctness of Plato, and I want to. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, completeness, whether it is an issue or not. Um, we didn't address completeness because, okay, so first of all, the uh, overall problem of multi edge and epistemic planning is undecidable, so we might not be complete in this sense. So uh, we are actually doing some work on undecidability, but uh, it's still an ongoing uh, process, so I cannot answer this uh, with certainty. Uh, but no, we do not think about, uh, about completeness. Uh, just about correctness, so uh, I got an answer fully. I'm sorry, but thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any more questions? No, okay.
okay? So let's thank Alessandro. So uh, last talk of the session and of the day is uh, um, the contribution um, from Francesco Calimeri, Marco Manna, Elena Mastria, o Mastria, non, non so, scusi, eh, Maria Concetta Morelli, Simona Perri, Jessica Zangari, IDLV SR, Extreme Reasoning System based on IDLV. Who's presenting? Elena, forse? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, not really. L'audio era molto basso. Eh? Sì, e uso un altro, un altro dispositivo così cioè, vedo se si. Mm, molto, molto basso. Non si capisce. Ok, no. un attimo. Elena, al momento sei muted. Mm. Ok, mi sentite ora? Adesso, perfetto. Ok, ho okay. collegato il nostro sito. Ok. Let's share the screen. Ok, can you see the screen? Yes, okay. yes, yes. yes. Ok, I'm Elena Mastria, PhD student at the University of Calabria. E so, um, wait, wait, ok. <laughs> Scusate. So, when we talk about stream reasoning, we refer to the continuous application of inference techniques on ID dynamic data streams. Stream reasoning goes beyond the data processing. Indeed, it applies a reasoning uh, um, a operation in order to get uh, useful knowledge from uh, the processing data. For this reason, uh, it becomes uh, relevant in contexts such uh, as uh, the IoT, smart city, and energy management, all uh, characterized by the presence of an environment rich of sources that at each moment produce a high volume of data. <coughs> In such context, uh, we need to reason about data in order to uh, get some insight, knowledge, and uh, support to the decision making process. So, a stream reasoner needs to perform uh, complex deduction tasks uh, um, on the processing data uh, along with some background knowledge. However, applying uh, um, expensive reasoning operation on the overall data stream is uh, a quite challenging pro problem both in terms of uh, uh, performances and memory consumption. So a stream reasoner often use a window-based processing to deal with the infinite data stream. <coughs> um, in, this, in such a setting, uh, the data are partitioned, the only the last, latest arrivals are used during the deduction task. Um, re uh, recently, the answer set programming uh, gained attention uh, as a basis for the stream reasoning. Um, this is because it allowed to um, declarative uh, um, define uh, compu uh, excuse me, complex computational problem. And moreover, uh, thanks to the presence of uh, uh, efficient SP implementation, it can be used in real world context. 
So uh, we want to obtain a novel and reliable SP stream reasoner that uh, inherits the strength from SP, such as uh, its declarative nature and its ease of use. That can be easily extended with the new construct that are relevant for the stream reasoning scenario and that uh, can efficiently use it uh, during uh, a within real world application. So today we present the first version of IDLV SR that is an SP based stream reasoner that actually support uh, um, normal certified SP programs reached with um, a set of constructs to, to reason over stream. So uh, let us uh, suppose that we want to answer the question, oh, uh, how many cars have passed in the last 20 seconds? In this case, uh, with IDLVSR, uh, we can model this problem with these simple two rules. As we can see at the first glance, it seems to be like a SP, but, but uh, it has uh, a small addition. Indeed, within the first rule, we use a special atom that allows us to count within a, win a window of 20 seconds and to derive the number of cars that uh, we observed during this window. Then we can use uh, the, uh, a, a normal aggregate atom to sum this value and obtain the total number. So uh, the most significant uh, addition that uh, IDLVS are introduced with respect to um, answer set programming is that uh, um, we can use the streaming atoms within the body of logic rules. In particular, um, for example, the first streaming atoms allow us to check whether A it, it, is it true at least the time and the considered time point. The second one allows us to check whether A is always true in the considered time point, while the last one allows us to count how many times A is true in the considered time point. So um, syntactically, some shortcuts are omitted, but the most important one is that A at least one in zero is actually equals to an SP standard atoms. So we can say that uh, a standard atoms is a special form of streaming atom, a special case of streaming atom. Um, so for example, let us... Uh, Suppose that uh, our system is processing the time point, the time point 15 and that uh, it received this snapshot of input. Uh, if we want to uh, evaluate uh, the atom B5 at least two times in 0, 1, and 3, we have to consider all the input associated to the time point Z, uh, T minus 0, T minus 1, and T minus 3. By looking at this specific uh, um, input, we can check that uh, actually this atom holds at the time point 15, because uh, it is true that uh, it, uh, B5 it is true at the time point 12 and time point 14. Um, while if we consider this, this other uh, streaming atom, we have to consider all the time point between t minus 0 and t minus 3. By looking at this, uh, uh, at this input, we can check that B always in, in free does not hold because uh, B5 is uh, false for uh, the time point 13 and the time point 15. Um, based on the shortcut uh, presented uh, before, we can, uh, we can see that uh, B5 always in free is uh, the contracted form for uh, the atom B5 always in 0, 1, 2, and 3. This shortcut is admitted because uh, uh, this set of natural number, number actually is, are uh, uh, the set of natural number between uh, 0 and 3. So we use uh, the interval notation to indicate this set. Um, let's see a modeling example. Uh, suppose that we want to build an intelligent monitoring system for the underground trains in the, uh, in the city of Milan. Uh, in this case, our uh, system should be able to identify the irregularities in train arrivals and uh, to send some alert in case of recurrent irregularities. We can define a traffic uh, as a regular if a passenger sees a train stopping every three to six minutes. 
Um, we can model this, uh, this problem uh, uh, using the rule in the box. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a special uh, uh, a keyword uh, in uh, the head of the third rule. In this case, uh, um, the uh, keyword temps mean that means that uh, all the derivation obtained from this rule um, are not part of the stream. Uh, what I mean? Um, in the context of uh, ideal VSR, whenever information is derived at a given time point can be used in the next time point to be evaluated because it became part of the stream. With the temp, uh, we allow to forget uh, those information on, uh, on which no uh, reasoning is required in the later time point. So, Let's see uh, a specific rule. Uh, the first rule uh, um, uh, says that uh, um, we have an irregular event if we observed a train in the last one to two minutes and uh, we are observing another train in the current, in the current minute. The second one uh, um, covers the case in which no trains uh, as uh, observed uh, in, um, in the last six minutes. The third one allows us to count how many irregularities we detected in the last 30 minutes, while the last two rules allow, allow us to um, check which kind of alert uh, to send on the basis of the num anomalies values. Um, so uh, our system is based on a continuous cooperation between two components. The first one is a Java application built on top of Apache Flink for processing data stream, while the second one is uh, um, the incremental reasoner um, I2DLD. I, I for performing complex reasoning tasks. Apache Flink is a distributed stream processor that allows us to efficiently manage data streams, obtaining a, a night drop and a low latency. While I2DLB, um, I2DLB is an SP grounder that uses overgrounding techniques to incrementally evaluate the SP programs. Uh, this is the architecture of uh, our system. Uh, as we can see, it, uh, it is formed by three main modules, the execution manager, the sub-program manager, and the, sub, uh, and the stream manager, all making use of the API exposed by Apache Flink. Without going into the technical details, let's see how it works uh, um, with a practical example. The execution manager takes as input uh, an ideal VSR program, uh, and uh, it is in charge of setting up all the uh, operation that must be performed in order to evaluate this program. Uh, in particular, as, as a first operation, it writes the input program into a um, standard SP1 by um, in practice replacing all the streaming atoms that are not equivalent with the standard SP1 with a standard SP1 and storing this mapping, uh, this, uh, this replacement in a spe special mapping. Then the execution manager analyzes the program and uh, find all the um, dependencies among the rule that are caused by a streaming literals, uh, um, by a, uh, a streaming literals. Uh, on the basis of, uh, in order to, um, to find the sub program that uh, can, can be pro separately processed. On the basis of such division, the um, execution manager uh, creates the Apache Flink data flow that schedule the, the, the operation that must be performed to um, evaluate each sub program of the input program. Uh, then uh, it sends the Apache Flink data flow to st the stream manager, the stream liter streaming literals mapping to the subprogram manager, and the um, standard SP program to I2DLV. 
Uh, at this point, uh, our uh, system can consume an input stream and produce the output. Uh, indeed, uh, um, in this phase, the stream manager is in charge of uh, evaluating all uh, the streaming atoms within the, uh, the input program and communicates with the sub-program manager when uh, um, the evaluation of a, a specific sub-program is required. Indeed, and the sub program manager take the evaluation from the stream manager, transform this uh, derivation in a proper ASP input and uh, on the basis of the streaming literal mapping and uh, ask it to the LV for the evaluation of this sub program. Then when the sub program, a sub program manager uh, obtain the result from my 2 dlv forward this information to the stream manager that uh, um, send uh, um, the new derivations uh, on uh, uh, the remaining part of uh, the data flow uh, until the, um, the output is not complete, the, out the evaluation of the overall program is not complete. Uh, so in order to assess uh, the performances uh, and uh, the reliability of our system, we conducted an experimental evaluation. In particular, for um, in the first analysis, we compared IDLV SR with the distributed SR. That is uh, another uh, distributed logic-based uh, stream reasoner that actually implement, implements a fragment of Lars. Um, we compared this system in terms of total time and number of accepted requests. And uh, um, in this case, this slide shows uh, the, um, the result obtained for the content caching benchmark that is a real time, a real world benchmark already used to uh, evaluate distributed SR. Um, the plot uh, reports uh, on the left axis uh, the total times uh, and uh, they are represented through a dashed line and uh, on the right axis uh, the number of accepted requests that, is, that are represented through um, a continuous line. Ideal VSR is identified by a black, uh, a black diamond while distributed SR is uh, identified by a, a white square. Uh, as we can see, ideal VSR behaves better than uh, uh, distributed SR in both, in both in terms of uh, a total time and a uh, number of accepted requests. Indeed, with respect to the total time, ideal VSR um, um, has a linear trend uh, uh, very close to 60 seconds, while uh, distributed SR seem to um, take longer for specific configuration of this experiment. Uh, moreover, the uh, ideal VSR uh, uh, always uh, uh, correctly accept and process uh, the incoming request, while distributed SR uh, um, seem to lose a part of them for the uh, for those encoding uh, uh, whose uh, um, windows uh, where the window size is small. Uh, we con uh, considered, uh, considered also a slightly different, uh, different uh, um, configuration from the content caching where the system receives more than one event per time point. Uh, also, this, um, this result shows, uh, um, uh, this show, um, a lose of the, uh, the incoming request for uh, the distributed SR system while uh, ideal VSR correctly pro still correctly process all the incoming request um, with the respect to the, uh, the total time uh, the trend of both system is similar that grow with the number of events per time point we consider also an another uh, benchmark that is a, an artificial benchmark formed by a single rule that requires a new join between two atoms uh, over a window also in this case, uh, the result of IDLV SR uh, are very um, encouraging. Indeed, it outperforms uh, the distributed SR both in terms of times and accepted requests. The biggest difference uh, is uh, related uh, um, to the accepted request where IDLV SR uh, correctly perform, uh, cor correctly process all the requests while distributed SR um, lose uh, miss 
that's uh, almost uh, all the request for those uh, configuration where uh, the events per time point, the number of events per time point is high. Um, in order to access how important is uh, the, um, the use of an incremental uh, of an incremental reason is per, uh, is per our system with respect to the total time, we compare the idle VSR with a version of the same system with uh, um, relying on an incremental uh, reasoner. In this case, uh, we can see that um, uh, IDL BSR uh, scales better when uh, um, it's based on incremental reasoner. Um, indeed, the, these results show that, that is, uh, it maintains the, time, the times smaller than the other and that the gap between the two lines becomes more relevant um, with the increasing of the problem size. In conclusion, we can say that uh, we presented the DLBSR that is uh, an SP based stream reason, stream reason that uh, is uh, based on a tight interaction between uh, IDLV, uh, IDLV, the incremental version of the IDLV, and uh, a flink based application that is uh, easily extendable by design and that uh, obtained a good performance and scalability in, uh, in, in resulting in uh, complex domain. As a future goal, we want to move towards a more complete uh, stream reasoner that uh, uh, by adding the support to additional lang language cost constructs and uh, um, by studying proper means for management of noise and incompleteness and uh, uh, by investigating new real world domains. Thank you for the attention. Thanks, Elena. So, uh, questions? Francesca? Uh, Marco. I have a question. Hi, Marco. Okay, Elena, so congratulations for the work. Very, very nice, very interesting. Um, I connect to your last point about the future work, about the constructs, no? so to, to, to the syntactic part of the new language. And so from what I can see, so you added uh, uh, some constructs, for example, uh, at least, for example, mm -hmm. always, uh, so which if I remember correctly, are already present in other uh, language or logic. For example, I can see that uh, at least is a constraint programming construct and always is a construct used in linear temporal logic, for example. So I'm curious to know whether, so you select, how to say, you select the construct at the state of the heart that are more amenable and useful for you, you define those by yourself or you took from another paper about stream reasoning? Okay, uh, we tried to, um capture with our syntax uh, the, the construct that are more useful in the steaming reason con con the context that uh, actually coincide uh, with this basic construct. So we, um, yes, we studied uh, uh, the already presented paper uh, and uh, we tried to um, take the most easy construct that uh, are uh, useful and uh, readable and uh, um, really usable in real context uh, for steam reasoning. For steam reasoning. Okay. I hope uh, I answered yeah. to your okay, question. Okay, so, so I expect that also the, the, the semantics of this construct is similar to the semantic of at least in constraint programming or always in linear temporal logic, I, I believe. Yes, yes. Um, okay. uh, uh, I, I have to be more clear. Um, we have not uh, already studied uh, the um, and compared our semantic with uh, other semantics because uh, it's uh, a study that requires a lot of time and uh, um, maybe a deeper analysis. We um, tried to uh, 
follow the, ne uh, the transparency of uh, the answer set programming. So um, we tried to uh, create a, a language that uh, um, is uh, transparent also for an ASP, a basic ASP user. So um, um, I don't know if uh, you get what I mean. Yes, uh, but, but so I, I, I didn't ask. So if you already compared it was just. Uh, okay. Grazie. Grazie. Altre, penso che, insomma, eh? Noi avremmo, we are going to have a, a coffee break and uh, uh, at what time should we resume? Uh, 15 minutes ago. I know. Uh, <laughs> we'll come back half past four. So, half past four. Okay. So, um, roughly 15 minutes of break. Uh, please uh, join uh, the, the General Assembly uh, from... Uh, I'm talking to the online participants, uh, of course, uh, we are here and uh, we are going to stay for, uh, for the assembly. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.